Hey everyone. Unfortunately, the weather's been pretty lousy, so we're gonna do a read aloud from my home today. And for those of you who are following along with their books, I'm on page 63 of Home of the Brave by Catherine Applegate. And today we are going to read um, a little, well, my goal is to get up to page like 70, 78. We'll see how far we get. Um, so if you haven't seen the other videos, please go back and make sure you're updating your journal. Um, like I said in the last video, you want to have your Home of the Brave journal up on one side of your screen and maybe the video up on the other so you can pause the video and then go uh, do your responses and then go back and forth if you can. If not, then you listen to it and then maybe go back and look for the questions to update. Um, I think it's easier to have both windows up at the same time. Our next chapter is called Once There Was, and I'm on page 63. The next morning, I don't know what I'm feeling. I'm excited, yes, but to go to school and learn? Oh, sorry, because to go to school and learn is a fine honor, but I'm also worried, oh, but I'm worried also. I don't know so many things. I don't even know what I don't know. My belly leaps like a monkey on a tree. In the camp, we had a teacher. Some days yes, some days no. Some days I was too ill with the fever to go. Some days the teacher couldn't come because of the men with guns. But on good days, the teacher might arrive with a piece of chalk and maybe even a book. Mostly he would help us learn English words so that we would be ready to leave the camp someday. But sometimes, there would be singing or a story or numbers on our fingers and toes to count. I liked the stories the best. Once there was a lion who could not roar. Once there was a man who sailed the sea. Once there was a child who found a treasure. The stories would lift me up and the words like a breeze beneath butterfly wings and take me far from the pain in my belly and the tight knot in my heart. I hope they will have stories in my school. If they don't know how, perhaps I can teach them. It isn't such a hard thing. All you must do is say once there was and let your hoping find the words. So I'm starting to make a noticing here. It's a think aloud and I'm noticing what Keck knows about school and his experiences. And the author is kind of setting up some foreshadowing here. Foreshadowing is telling a little bit about what's going to happen in the future, kind of setting the ground for what's gonna happen in the future. And I know about American schools, and I know you know about American schools because we're all in one, and based on Keck's experience with school, he's going to run into some bumps in the road, and I can kind of tell what they're going to be, um, and I bet you can tell what they're going to be also. The next chapter is called New Desk. I'm on page 66. Dave makes Excuse me, Dave takes me to school. When I see it, I use the words I learned from the TV machine. No way! It's big enough to graze a herd of cattle and made of fine red square stones surrounded by many tall, not dead trees. It's a place for a leader of men to work in, not a place for small children to learn their numbers. Dave sees my falling open mouth. Don't be scared, Keck, he says. But I'm not scared. Not like that. Scared is for men with guns, and maybe just a little for flying boats, finding its way back to Earth. So our first stop and jot is, what can the reader infer? Infer meaning what you already know and what the book is telling you. What can the reader infer about the way that Keck is feeling as he sees his school for the first time? What do you think he's feeling right now, and why do you think he's feeling that? Stop and jot. Inside my school, the floor shines like ice. I walk carefully. Thin metal doors with silver handles line the walls. Those are called lockers, Dave says. Come on, we're early, but the teacher wants to meet you. Waiting in a big windowed room is a woman with black hair that dances and sturdy arms and eyes that tell jokes. You must be Keck, she says, and then she used my word for hello. I'm ready to begin my learning, I say, and she tosses out a loud laugh like a ball into the air. I 
I can see you mean business, she says. A man comes in, young and short, with skin the color of rich earth, just like mine. He reaches me. He, he says he is Mr. Franklin. And he helps sometimes in class when Mrs. Hernandez needs to do her deep breathing. Everyone laughs, so I laugh too, because it's always good to be polite. This will be your desk, Mrs. Hernandez says. Have a seat. She points to a shiny chair and little table. A chair of your of my own and a table I table excuse me, and a table too? I smother the thought like an ember near dry grass. I'm very sorry, but I can't, I say softly. I don't have cattle for such a fine desk as this. Oh, she says, you don't have to pay for this desk, Keck. School's free here. You just bring your mind and your smile every day, okay? Carefully, I sit. I like very much this new desk with its cool, smooth top. My mouth will not stop smiling. Ready. You're not going to understand a lot of what we say at first, Mrs. Hernandez says. This is called an ESL class. You and your classmates will be learning English together. It means they won't always understand you, and you won't always understand them. I'm used to not understanding, I say. It's like playing a game with no rules. She nods. That's exactly what it's like. I know, because I came to the U.S. from Mexico, and I couldn't speak a word of English. This is a surprise. A teacher who did not know all things? Did you not know things also? I ask Mr. Franklin. Me? I'm from Baton Rouge, she says. That's kind of like another country. I couldn't understand these crazy northern folks for the longest time. Some of his words get lost on their way to my ears. But I can see from his face that his meaning is kind. When you have a question, Mr. Franklin, I will be here to help, says Mrs. Hernandez. Okay, it's, I'm sorry, let me read that again. When you have a question, Mr. Franklin and I will be here to help, says Mrs. Hernandez. She points to the sky. You just raise your hand, like this, okay? I nod. I say okay, just like her. I raise my hand. Yes, she says, smiling big. I ask, when will the learning begin? So your next stop in John is Keck says that some words get lost on the way to his ears. Do you think they really get lost? Can words really get lost? What actually happened here? What is, what is the author trying to do for you here? The next chapter is Cattle, page 73. That stop and jot again is for page 72. So the next chapter, Cattle, page 73. In my class, my long name class called English as a Second Language, we were 16, 16 people with 12 ways of talking. When we talk at once, we sound like a music class. We, uh, I can hear down the hall hoots and squeaks and thuds, but no songs you can sing. I look at our faces and see all the colors of the earth, brown and pink and yellow and white and black, and yet, we are all sitting at the same desks, wanting to learn the same thing. Mrs. Hernandez tells everyone my name and my old home. Then she thanks us. No, sorry. Then she asks us to draw a picture on a black wall to show where we came from. One boy, Jamie, from Guatemala, draws a mountain with a hole called a volcano. Sahar from Afghanistan draws a camel, th though... To be truthful, it looked more like a lumpy dog. I draw a bull with great carving horns, curving horns, like the finest in my father's herd. I even give him a smile, and it takes me a while to decide on his coat. In my words, we have ten different names for the colors of cattle. But the writing chalk is only white. I'm working on a tail when someone from the back of the room says, Moo! Then more say it, and more, and more, and soon we are a class of cattle. At last, we can all understand each other. I think maybe some of the students are laughing at me, but I don't mind so much. 
to hear the cattle again is good music. Last chapter, Lunch, page 76. After much schooling, a sound comes like a great bee buzzing. The bell means lunch, Mr. Franklin explains. He gives me a small piece of blue paper. This is for you for food. Thank you very much, I say in the most polite English words. But I don't understand how the paper can help my noisy belly. You give the paper to the cooking people and they give you, they will give you food, Mr. Franklin explains. Tastes much better than paper, he laughs. Well, usually anyway. The eating room is grand with long tables and strange and wonderful smells and many students chattering. I stand in a line and soon kind of white-hatted, kind white-hatted people fill my plate high with food. Ahead of me, I see a snowball girl named I see the snowball girl named Hannah from my building. She says, don't eat the mystery meat if you value your life. Then she points at the brown wet pile on my plate and makes a face that says bad taste. When my tray is heavy with the gifts of food, I stand still and stream and in the stream of students, I don't know where to go to enjoy my feast. Hannah waves, follow me, she says. I'll tell you what's safe to eat. But it's all so fine, I say. She shakes her head. Kid, you got a lot to learn. Our last stop and job for the day is Hannah. Is, how is Hannah treating Keck? And what in the story makes you think this? Do you think Hannah's going to be a good friend to Keck? Um, and what in the story makes you think that? That's it for today. See you guys tomorrow.